Hello class. This is the video for the second part of section 2.2 uh, and I'm going to start off uh, not with the slides I've been going through but just with an explanation of, of equations and solutions of equations uh, so we can build up to free variables. So here we have one equation one equation and one variable and usually when we have one equation one variable there's one solution right this is basic algebra we can solve 3x equals a minus 9 so x equals a, a negative 3 so that's nice usually we get one solution so it's a linear system right these are all linear equations um, it's not always true um, if I write down 3x plus 5 equals 3x plus 5 then there's actually infinitely many solutions. In fact, any real number I plug in for x on one side, any number I plug in for x on one side, it makes it true. So you plug in any value for x, you just get it, you get a true equation. If you simplify, you just get x equals x or 0 equals 0. Um, so, yeah, which is always true. So, um, so it's not always. Um, we don't always get one solution when we have one equation and one variable. Here we have two equations, oh sorry, two variables, one equation, two variables. And here, we can't solve, there's not one solution, there's infinitely many solutions. Um, all of those solutions lie on a line, and usually we solve for y. It's kind of what we've trained you guys to do, minus 3 halves x minus 4 halves. So we solve for y. And here we think about this in a little bit different way. Um, here we can think we think about that we have one input, and we get one output. And this is a way of generating the solutions. There's there's one solution for any for any x value that we plug in, so we can. Plug in the x. Y is determined from that, and we know how to calculate y with, with this side. So we can generate all the solutions by plugging in, in all possible values of x. So um, this is like our first example of what we call a free variable. We can choose. We can choose what we want it to be. So this is uh, this idea is one you've been working with already for years in your mathematical career um, but it'll it's going to emerge and it's going to look a little different but but the idea is still the same here we have um, one equation and three variables and we could solve for z notice we, here we solve for x first one we solve for x this one we solve for y. <laughs> Here, let's solve for z. Um, so we can solve for z. We get a negative one third x uh, minus two thirds y um, plus one. And um, here we have two inputs. So to generate all of the possible solutions, w there's one for each any combination of x and y. So we have to pick an x and pick a y, and then z is determined. Um, so this is the equation of a plane. And one way to think about what's happening is if we draw this grid, well, this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis, and this is the z-axis. Um, I could go to the point where x is a negative 3 and y is 3. Sorry, x is 3, y is a negative 3. And I could plug that in. If x is 3, then I get a minus, um, a minus 1 third times 3 minus 2 thirds. y is a negative 3, so plug in a negative 3 plus 1. So z equals... I can simplify. Here I get a positive 2. Here I get a minus 1. And here I get a plus 1. So I end up with 
a positive 2. So uh, I go up 2. So, so that's, that's the point. That's one solution of that system. There's lots, and they would create a plane if we did all of that. So I can use x and y as in inputs. So here I have two free variables. Okay. Um, so remember that um, in, with linear equations and systems of linear equations, we only have three options. We either have one solution, like this here. We have infinitely, infinitely many solutions, like these two, or we have no solutions. And the infinitely many solutions show up as lines or planes or hyperplanes. So um, now let's move to how about this one? Thanks. Okay. So here we have a system of equations. So you can think about this in a couple different ways. Um, first, we can think about it geometrically. So this is two planes. And as long as they're not parallel, then we, they will intersect at a line. And that line will be the, uh, all of this. It'll be the solution to this system. Um, it, the, uh, any point on that line will make both of these true. Um, but we can also think about it another way. You can think about it in terms of pieces of information. So here we have one piece of information and we had one variable and that's enough to know exactly what that variable is. Here we had one piece of information but we had two variables. Like each equation is a piece of information. Um, almost. We'll talk about times when it isn't. Um, and we had two variables that gave us one free variable like we had since we only had one piece of information that kind of lets us tie down one of the variables but the other variable is is a free variable it's an independent variable um, here we have one one equation so we have one piece of information and we have three variables so we're really down to uh, we have two independent variables because that information allows us to solve for one not to, not knowing the specific uh, value for that one, but what the relationship is with the other ones. So once we pick x and y, that other one is determined. Here, we can also think about this as we have two pieces of information. I'm going to spell pieces. Two pieces of information. And that means we should be able to solve, like say something about two variables but one of the variables we won't be able to say something about, and that will be our free variable. So we'll come up back to this pieces of information idea um, in a minute. Um, so two pieces of information. Um, they're not, if you just list, equations are, are not always pieces of information. They have to be different in to pieces. They have to be different equations. So x plus y equals 1 and 2x plus 2y equals 2. I have two equations, but those aren't two different pieces of information. Uh, it's really just the same information written in a different form. So I really just have one, one piece of information there. And sometimes our equations, they look different, so they look like they're different, but they actually end up just, one of them might be the same information that's contained in, in, in the other two. So let's, let's do some row reduction on this. So this will be a good review from one point, or some, from two point two. The first part. So I'm going to augment this matrix, and then I'm going to do re reduction. Um, so I, I have a a one here. Great. Let's use this one and turn this to a zero. So I'm going to multiply. I'm going to keep this first row the same. And the second row I'm going to replace with a minus 1 times row 1 plus row 2. So if I multiply that first row by a minus 1, then I'll have a minus 1 plus 1, which is 0. A minus 1 minus 1, which is a minus 2. A minus 1 
uh, plus 2, which is 1, a minus 3 plus 2, which is a minus 1. Okay, and now I'm, I'm going to, you see this is going to be a pivot position here, so I'll, I'll make it 1, and then I'm going to, and let's go with that much. Let's make a 1. So I'm still going to keep this first row the same, and now I'm going to multiply by a minus 1 half. I'm going to multiply row 2 by the minus 1 half, and that'll be our new row 2. So 0, 1, minus 1 half, 1 half. Okay. Um, now I have, I'm pretty doing well at getting ones in my pivot positions there. Now I'm going to use this one to get this one zero. And so I'm going to multiply the second row by a minus one and add to row one. So and I'm going to just keep that second row the same. And <clears throat> So if I multiply by, uh, what was I doing? Minus 1. So a minus 1 times row 2 plus row 1. So 0 times a minus 1 is 0, plus 1 is just the 1. Uh, here I get a minus 1 plus, a minus 1 plus 1 will be 0. Here I'll get a 1 half plus the 1, which will be 3 halves. And then I'll have a minus 1 half plus 3, which is 5 halves. And this is as far as I can go. Um, this is in reduced row echelon form. And uh, I have two, I have these two pivot positions, so I have two pivot columns. Um, and these correspond to the variables x and y. Um, but z is not in a pivot column. This is what we call a free variable. But this is how we find our free variables. Okay. Um, technically, we could pick any of these to be our free variable, and we could so and we could solve for the other ones. But this is standard practice: is to to row reduce it into reduced row echelon form, and then all of the columns that do not have a pivot position they are free variables. And how do we write this system out? Well. Um, we're going to rewrite it. We're going to, like how are we going to write this solution out? We're going to write it back as a system with x, y's, and z's. Um, we've saved a lot of time by not writing in our, our x, y's, and z's and our pluses and our equal signs doing this. Um, so we get x um, plus 3 halves z equals 5 halves. And then we don't have any x's there. Then we have y minus 1 half z equals 1 half. And, um, and now we can solve for x and y in terms of z. We talked about we had two pieces of information, and those pieces of information can help us know what x is and y is, but it's, not, but it's x and y in terms of z. Um, We'd still need one more piece of information to figure out exactly what z might be in that case. And z, what, what are we going to say for z? Well, z, we're going to let it equal itself. We're going to let it equal whatever uh, whatever we decide z could be. In the same way that we, we haven't tied down x in this equation of a line here, like we, we let x be whatever input. We can use it to generate functions. We can use it to answer questions about that line and about points on that line and other things. We just let it be whatever x is. Um, the difference is we don't usually write this, uh, this equation out in, um, in vector form. So, um, so we're going to let z equal z, and then we're going to, to pull these z's over to the other side so that we have an x we have x in terms of z, which is 5 halves minus 3 halves z. We have y in terms of z, which is um, 1 half plus 1 half z. And z is in terms of z. That's, z is whatever z is. And now we're going to rewrite all of these in here as vectors. 
and we're going to end up putting it into vector form for a line. So we the solution is a line. Uh, the, the intersection of two planes is a line, and we're going to rewrite this. We're going to keep our constants, and that is a point. This represents the point that the plane goes through, and we'll write z minus three halves plus a half and one. So we pulled out our z, and this looks like um, is the direction vector of the line. This looks like the vector um, vector form of a line, and it is. So the only difference is, like here we have a z here, and we have a z on this side too. That's kind of weird. That's not how we wrote an equation of lines before. We used s or t as a parameter, and it's better for us to to do that. So we can do. Um, we're going to drop z and write write it as just pick an s or a t. So five halves, one half, zero plus t minus three halves, one half, one. So one of the advantages of picking t is um, we can change this direction vector. We can scale this direction vector to whatever we want, and it's still the equation of the plane. But but if we change if we change this direction vector here, then then the z won't work that we have here. So we'd have to end up changing z. Um, well, to keep the same relationship that I had with uh, previously, so um, so it's good practice to to replace with with a parameter. Um, we don't always, you know, in some of the examples they they don't, but it's just good practice. Okay, and so here we have infinitely many solutions. We have another input. So notice we have one input, and here we get three outputs. So it's one of the things that's different from the things we looked at before. Before we we just had one output. We had one output with we had one output with z. We had one output here with y. Um, the difference here is we have three outputs. Um, so so this captures all three outputs with our one input. So. Um, yeah. So uh, this is a little bit of review, but also like trying to put together a bunch of pieces about infinite, uh, infinite solutions and free variables and pieces of information, equations, and such. So let's go to um, here we go. So uh, we're going to continue on where we left off. We did cover this briefly, but this, um, if you haven't seen this before, this is a really nice thing to to follow. Sometimes it's not the most, um, it always works, but sometimes it's a, it's a um, there are other more strategic ways to do it, so you don't have to do as much computing, but this is one thing that you can, one uh, algorithm you can always use, and we'll see it in the last example that we do today, and there, there are, we have several we have five supplemental videos that walk through row reduction uh, systems of equations up online. A couple on, uh, like three on the 2.1 and 2.2a um, supplemental video section and two on the 2.2b supplemental video section. So so you can see, have several examples of people walking, walking through those. Okay, oops. All right, so here's a system of equations. It says find the follow solutions to the following system. So we have we have three equations and we have four unknowns. Automatically, that's enough information to know that we will have to have at least one free variable. We might not even have more, um, but we know we have to have at least one because each of these is a piece of each of the equations is a piece of information that allows us to to tie down one variable in terms of the other free variables. And so we don't have enough to tie down all four, all four. If we had one more solute, one more, uh, one more equation that gave us uh, new information, then um, then we could solve for all four, or we might have no solution. But we um, we we could so solve and know exactly the value for um, where these hyperplanes would intersect because they'd intersect at one point. 
So put it into an augmented matrix and row reduce. Um, we didn't uh, show you how we row reduce, but we row reduce. And notice we have three pivot positions. So we have three pivot columns. So we have X, Y, Z, and W. Or sometimes, sometimes when we start getting past two or three, we just start doing X1, X2, X3, and X4. Um, so X, Y, Z, and W. So Z is a free variable in this situation. Um, and this is using the technique that we just went through with this other example. We, we use, we solve for x1, x2, and x3 in terms of z, or in this case, x, we solve for x1, x2, and x4, sorry, in terms of x3. And um, x3 is a free variable, so x3 just equals x3. That's where this, this piece comes from right here. So we rewrite each of these as um, in terms of the equation that they represent with the variables, solve for the leading coefficient in e solve for the variable that corresponds to the leading coefficient in each of those. Uh, so you have an x1, an x2, an x4, and then x3 is our free variable, x3 equals x3. Then we rewrite them. Um, this person rewrote th this professor rewrote it as one vector first and then broke it up, but you can do it either way. Um, and we end up with, with something similar that we saw before. This is the equation of a line in vector form where you have the point and the direction vector and x3 is the free variable. So that, um, we could replace that with just s or t to represent that same line. So, okay. Um, so we already called, I already talked to you about free variables. Any variable corresponding to a non-pivot column is a free variable. And these other ones are called leading variables. Okay, so x, y, z, w, if we label the variables that way, then they're free variables. x1, x2, and x4, if we do the, sub, the subscripts, they're leading variables, x3 is free. Um, So let's do another example, find the solutions of the following system. Um, so <clears throat> rewrite it as an augmented matrix. So the first thing we're gonna do, we start with this position. Um, we can always make it one by dividing by, or multiplying by its reciprocal. Sometimes it's not, it's not a great strategy to make it one because it, sometimes it just makes the math harder. But we can we're going to use this to make this one zero. That's like the first, the second step. Then use that one or whatever value that is to make this one zero if it's not already zero. So that's what we do first. Multiply this first row by a negative two. So it's a negative two times row one, add it to negative two, and we get these zeros. Because uh, we get negative two plus two, negative two plus two, negative six plus six. And here we get two plus four, so we get six. And we could do it again, multiply by a negative, multiply this first row by a negative three, that's what th that represents. Negative three times the first row and add it to the row three. And we get zero minus one, negative eight and four. And here, this is trouble. Um, what does this mean? If we have a row of, v zeros, on, a row of zeros on this side, but a non-zero over there, it means that there is no solution. This is called inconsistent. If a solution, if a system has at least one solution, it's called consistent. If it doesn't have a solution, it's called inconsistent. So there's no solution because this is equi the equivalent stating the equivalent statement of you have no x's, no y's, and no z's, and you get the value of six, and that's impossible. So. Um, so that's how we know if we have an inconsistent system is if we row reduce and we have um, we have all zeros on the left hand side of the augmented sign and then a non-zero uh, on the right hand side. Or another way to think of it is if we end up if we have if this uh, the augmented column that last column is a um, if it is a, has a pivot position if it's a pivot column then we're in trouble. 
Okay. Um, and this summarizes the statement that I just read. If you ever have zeros and then a non-zero matched up on a line, then it is um, then it does not exist. So. Okay. Um, just some more terms. Gaussian elimination, that's when you get it to, to row echelon form, not reduced row echelon form, but row echelon form, and then you solve by back substitution. Gauss-Jordan elimination, that's when you get all the way to reduced row echelon form and solve. We will almost always use this, but just so you know if, um, if this is the way that it, uh, the book describes these two things, and like on the exam, if they, if they asked you to use a certain method, then you would know. Um, or a question about the certain method, then you can understand which ones those are. Okay, rank. Um, the idea of rank is the idea of pieces of information. Oops. <laughs> pieces of info. I just took it right at that way. Info. So the number of pieces of information that you have in your system. So usually every equation is has a, a piece of informa uh, a new piece of information. Um, but sometimes you can have three equations, but there's really only two pieces of information there, or only one piece of information there. Uh, in the example that I had before gave before x plus y equals one. Well, I could rewrite this. And that doesn't give me any more information. Um, x plus y equals 1, 2x plus y equals 3. That gives me a new piece of information. These are different equations. Um, if I write down 3x plus 2y equals 4, that looks different than these other ones. But actually, this does not give me any more information because it is actually just these two added together. And I already know with these two that I can add them together and get and get this equation. It doesn't help me. It doesn't uh, get any more information than I already had. Um, so the the word that we're going to use for that piece of information is rank. And the way we find this is it's the number of non-zero rows in the row echelon form of a matrix. Um, so when we row reduce. Um, when we row reduce, um, if we ever have um, all all of the pie the unique pieces of information, will end up having a row with a leading with a, a a leading entry that won't be zero. But but other pieces of others other information other equations that were redundant, they they become zero rows down here. So if I if we had another one and we row reduced and and we had these zeros. This row of zeros, then we hey, we really only have three three pieces of information here, even though there were four equations written written down to start off with. And the way you decide the rank, so one way to decide the rank is it's the number of non-zero rows. So here, it's, this would be a rank three matrix because we have three three rows that are non-zero. It's it's it also is the same the number of pivot columns it, that's equivalent. Um, and um, here's a theorem. This helps us to know there's a relationship between the number of free variables and the rank. And the rank is if you take the number of variables, so n is the number of variables, um, it's also the number of columns in the coefficient matrix. So um, I'm sorry, it doesn't like when I write small in, this, in Adobe. So uh, the number of columns in the coefficient matrix minus the number of free variables gives you your rank. Because there's only two kinds of variables. There's leading variables and there's free variables. All of the variables have to be free variables or they have to be leading variables. And any leading variable is, adds to the rank of A. So if you add up all the leading variables and you add up the the free variables that equals n. So, the, so you could rewrite it as n equals 
leading variables plus or, you know, number of leading variables, number of free variables. So, um, so the rank is important because it tells us how many pieces of information we have, and it also will connect to like the the dimension of of things uh, that are connected to a matrix. Also, so find the ranks of the following matrix here: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nice matrix. You will reduce it. Actually, it turns out that you really have two pieces of information here in this matrix. Um, only only two two things are independent. So your rank is two because we have a row of zeros. Um, the row reduce this one, you get rank three because each there's three rows that that are non-zero. Here we have two rows that are non-zero, so it's rank two. Even though we have three variables, it's still only rank two. So because we only have two equations, you can think about it as two equations, or you can think about it as uh, um, this isn't augmented, but um, it's the same idea. Each of those. Each of these row vectors uh, is different, so we have two pieces of information. Okay, I think we're almost done with this. Um, a homogeneous system. Um, if we have a system of equations where the constants are all zero, this is a way to write it as a as a matrix. If we have If we have a system, um, and this column is all zero, then then it's called homogeneous. Um, the prefix homo means like the same, and here they're all the same, <laughs> like they're all zero. So, and one of the nice things about a homogeneous system is they are there's always at least one solution. A homogeneous system is always consistent, and it is if you pick. If you pick all the variables to be zero, then uh, or the solution, yeah, the x vector um, when when x the x vector, which is the unknown vector, all has values of zero, then then the outcomes are all zero. You can always take zero of your first variable and zero of your second variable, and zero of your third variable, etc., and um, and get zero of them. This is called the trivial solution. So lots of new words starting up in chapter two. So lots of new phrases. Um, when will there be a non-trivial solution? So we already know there's a, uh, there's always a trivial solution, but what about if there's a non-trivial solution? Um, oh, it has a trivial solution, a non-trivial solution, only if you have a free variable. So um, as long as you have at least one free variable, you'll have a non-trivial solution. And um, And one way to know that is if you have more columns than rows, then you know it has to have infinitely many solutions because you don't have enough pieces of information to tie down every single variable. So if you have more columns than rows, you know it has to have infinitely many solutions. Um, so here's this, an example of a homogeneous system. So it's a system that on the, the constants on this side are all zero. Um, so let's solve this and we'll describe the solutions. It might just be Hey, the only way to make this true is to have x1 equals 0, x2 equals 0, and x3 equals 0. Or uh, it might not be. We, this might not have a rank 3. This might have a rank 2 or a rank 1, and in which case we'll have, we'll have free variables. So we row reduce. So, so, so again, when we row reduce, we're going to start with this value, and then we're going to use that value to get zeros below us below that, and then we go to this value if it's non-zero and use that to get zeros below it. So this is a summary of that row reduction algorithm. And then if this is non-zero, we'll make this a 1, and then use that to make zeros um, above it, and then finally we use this one to get zeros uh, to make that zero, if possible. It doesn't always work out uh, because sometimes you'll end up with a row of all zeros. Okay, so um, here we have this, the three right here. We can, to get rid of this negative three and get to zero, we can multiply the first row by a negative one and add it to the second row. And so that's this. Oh, sorry, we, don't, we just 
We have to multiply by 1. We don't want to multiply by a negative 1. Because if we just add those together, we get 0. So that's that's what they did first to get there, that row. And if we multiply by a negative 2 up here and then add it to this bottom row, then we'll, then that will get, make this 6, 0. The position where the 6 is in, that'll be 0. And so that's where this negative 2 times row 1 plus row 3, that's this new row here. And now we go to this position. Let's use it to get the z to get a zero below. So we're going to multiply that by an eight, by three and add to that row three. So three times r row two from over here. Add it up, and we get all zeros in the denominator. I mean, in, not the denominator, but that uh, that bottom row. Now to make it one, uh, we can just multiply that third row, that second row, by one third. And now we can use this 1 to get this, make this 5, 0. So you can multiply that by, n multiply that second row by a negative 5 and add. So then you get just 5, a negative 5 plus 5, so that'll be 0. Nothing else changes. And finally, um, we, can multi we can get this to, to 1 by multiplying by 1 third. Um, you could have started by multiplying that first row by one third way back here, um, but then you would have like five thirds, negative four thirds. Um, so, so sometimes it makes sense not to do that early on. Sometimes it doesn't make much of a difference. So now we are in reduced row echelon form. Okay, we have our two columns and um, our two pivot columns. The pivot positions are ones. All of the other um, positions in those columns are zero and we've got them in the right order so all of the pivot positions of uh, all of the pivot positions above another one is to the left excuse me and now we can rewrite this out as a system so this means x1 is is e minus four thirds x3 equals zero x2 equals zero but x what about x3 that's a free variable um, that's um, so x3 equals whatever x3 equals so we could write that down here x3 equals x3 that's going to be an input that we can use to define all of the solutions of the system and so we write that out as a matrix uh, or as a vector and then you can pull out that that x3 and so it's a line through the origin how do we know it's a line through the origin because th it wouldn't change if we put the point here and it did this point plus x3 times um, this direction vector. That's the equation of a line, and the point is 0, 0, 0. So it's a line through the origin in R3, and this is the direction vector. There it is. So, and we can use x3, or we can replace x3 with s or t, and we can use that to define all the solutions of the system, to find all of them. I think that's it. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much.